Hello, everyone, and welcome to this webinar offered by the National Collaborating Center for Healthy Public Policy. The title for the webinar is The Wellbeing Policy Turn for Central Government Initiatives and the Role of Public Health. My name is Val Morrison, and I am a scientific advisor at the National Collaborating Center for Public Health. And joining me from our center today are Milen Magua. Hi, Milen, and thanks for joining us. And thanks also for um, looking after all of the uh, registration and logistics for the webinar today. And also my colleague, Alexandra Espin Espinoza. Um, thanks and hi to Alexandra as well, who is here um, to support us today. So just before we get started, a few housekeeping um, technical notes that we will use the Q&A box on the Zoom screen for questions, either of a technical nature. So if you're having trouble, um, please address your questions to the Q&A box and Milen will look after that. And also questions specifically on the presentation, please use that box. If you would like to share resources or um, connect with each other during the webinar, please feel free to do that using the chat box um, and address to everyone so that other participants can see. The question should be visible to everyone. Uh, and so if you see a question that you would like to ask, um, please vote for that question. And then we can see during the question period if there are questions that several people would like to ask and we can move those ones to the top of the list. The, web the webinar today will be recorded and will be available after today on our website. So please keep that in mind with your questions and the chat function because those are also recorded and will be uh, a permanent record uh, of the webinar. We also will ask you at the end, as usual, to fill out an evaluation which will be sent by um, email as well as in the chat box towards the end of uh, the webinar. I will just briefly uh, introduce the National Collaborating Centers for Public Health. I know that many of you are familiar with the program. So we are a network of six collaborating centers for public health located across Canada. In our case, we are, our offices are located in Montreal um, at the um, site of the Institut National de Santé Publique, the National Public Health Institute in Quebec. And each of the centers concentrates on one main focus area of public health. So in our case, we focus on healthy public policy. And by healthy public policy, that um, come from outside of the formal healthcare sector, but that have an impact on health, things like transportation and housing um, and uh, wealth redistribution policies, for example, um, among many others. <clears throat> so you can see here a list of our various um, projects that we focus on. And before moving into the webinar itself, I would like to take the time to acknowledge the land that I am on today and that our offices are on as well and acknowledge that we are on an age old indigenous territory that is a place of meeting and diplomacy between peoples and the site of the Great Peace Treaty. We'd like to thank the Ganyekehaga Nation for their hospitality on this unceded territory. The outline for the webinar, webinar today is as follows. We'll just sort of briefly talk about um, introduction to well-being policies and the context in which they have emerged um, and talk about this in terms of what's sometimes called the beyond GDP or gross domestic product um, movement and how this has contributed to the emergence of well-being policies. And then we will look at the examples from four well-being initiatives of central governments in, in, in all four cases of national governments. And then we can, we'll talk a little bit about the links between these initiatives and the contributions of public health, both actual contributions in terms of those four um, initiatives, as well as potential contributions to these types of policies generally. So just before diving in, um, to give us an idea of who is in the room, we had um, over 300 people, 300 and 
I forget, just over 300 registered for um, the webinar. And during the registration process, we asked you how familiar you are with these recent developments in of well-being policy um, initiatives. And as you can see here, um, a great many of you have a little bit of familiarity with these policies. Um, a, a sizable number have say that you have um, none at all familiarity and just a few are very familiar. In light of that, um, although the vast majority of those with us today have little or no familiarity with these policies, I think there is an intuitive sense in some cases uh, as well as perhaps a, a more profound sense based on the knowledge of these policies. But there is definitely an interest for public health and a role for public health to play. Um, that is the sense that um, you have shared with us um, in your registration. So if we think about why um, so many of us in the room, and, and I think it's probably generally true, have at least a little familiarity with the emergence of well-being policies. It is in part because of the presence, um, particularly during the early months of, of the pandemic in, in North America, at least, and in Europe in early 2020, um, a number of academic pub pub publications, sorry, newspapers and magazines featured stories on the emergence of well-being and the importance of considering well-being above and beyond or at the very least alongside of economic considerations of how um, a country uh, and a country's population is faring. So you see here examples of some of these um, headlines and also a couple of centers that were also formed um, in this case, the What Works Wellbeing Center in the UK and the Wellbeing Economy Alliance, sometimes called We All, um, which is an alliance of various um, organizations and governments dedicated to uh, well-being uh, and well-being economics. If we look at this emergence in a slightly different way, we can see the emergence of this beyond GDP movement on a kind of timeline, and, and it's a very partial timeline, um, but we see from around 2009, although the Bhutan's policy of gross national happiness that some of you might be aware about um, was launched in 2008. Um, but 2009, we see the Stiglitz report, that is the report um, that is um, meant to respond to the economic crisis and suggest a way forward and out of um, the economic crisis of 2008, the financial um, crisis of 2008 and the uh, great recession that followed. So we see in fairly quick succession, a number of policies and organizations and documents that emerge in that 10 or 15 um, year period, including um, the launch of the, the Wellbeing Economies Alliance that I mentioned earlier, the OECD and the UN um, putting out reports on, on well-being and quality of life, the perhaps best well-known example of well-being policy, which is the, the well-being budget um, that was adopted in New Zealand in 2019. And that year is also the first time that we see mention of well-being in policy terms in Canada, where um, the move to include quality of life indicators and well-being indicators was um, in the mandate letters of some ministers in 2019 in Canada. And then in the spring of 2021, the federal government launched their um, well-being initiative. So something that we've seen emerge across a number of um, countries uh, including here in Canada on both the federal scale and as we'll um, discuss briefly, more local initiatives as well. So this movement of GDP, uh, of beyond GDP, um, comes in a sense, although it's, it's fairly recent um, and has taken hold, I think it's fair to say, in many different disciplines and in, in many different um, political arenas, 
One of the things that we have found is that it's difficult to pin down one singular, it's almost impossible to pin down one singular definition of well-being, but even to come up with sort of common signposts for um, what exactly we're talking about. But there does seem to be some kind of agreement on the need to go beyond economic measures of prosperity, such as gross domestic product, which is most commonly used um, you know, even in, in everyday terms, we see on the news how GDP has gone up or gone down, regularly reported on, and as a kind of stand-in for how we're doing economically, but also um, socially. And so there, there has been a sense for many years that we need to go beyond that. And in fact, many countries have been going beyond those measures um, they're not perhaps reported on as broadly, but including measures that go beyond um, gross domestic product and, and other sort of blunt um, measures of, of economic growth. So in the global context, um, as I said, we see a number of large scale international events and conferences in the wake again of the financial crisis of 2008 and we now are at a point where more than half of the countries that are members of the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development use some kind of indicators uh, that um, go beyond or alongside of, again, measures such as GDP. So measures that are related to health and safety, the availability and appropriateness of leisure activities, inclusiveness, and particularly environmental um, sustainability. And as we will see, some countries have gone even further than that and adopted some form of uh, well-being policy all the way up to and including a well-being budget. So in the Canadian context, um, as I said before, the federal government has framed its quality of life strategy as building on its commitments and policies um, and that are aligned with the well-being approach um, from elsewhere. So things like the um, agenda for sustainable development or the incorporation of gender-based analysis plus or GBA plus um, into federal level policymaking. We've also seen interest at other levels in Canada, including at the provincial level in Nova Scotia, for example, as well as in several cities, including um, Montreal and Victoria, for example. And here we have um, the image from the quality of life strategy of the federal government. So I was saying a few minutes ago that, that there, there isn't, there doesn't seem to be, um, and perhaps that's owing to its interdisciplinary nature um, of well-being studies, um, we might use that term, um, so that we haven't seen the emergence the way we might in public health approaches like harm reduction or health and all policies or health impact assessment that have um, fairly robust um, frameworks that have been developed within um, specific disciplines. And we haven't seen, at least I haven't seen, I should uh, be specific about that, the emergence of a single framework um, for talking about and especially for measuring well-being. So what we do see is that well-being is usually accounted for in one of two ways, uh, and that is objective, what, uh, what's called objective well-being. So well-being that can be based on predetermined and measurable criteria in terms of indicators, things like income, um, and that's used to document uh, phenomena that exist independent of subjective awareness um, of well-being. There's also a variety of subjective measures for well-being, so evaluative measures which um, seek to assess an individual's life as a whole and satisfaction with their life as a whole that usually um, is posed as a singular question about life satisfaction today or these days. Um, eudaimonic measures that are individual perceptions of meaning and purpose, so our sense of how important our contribution to our lives, the lives of those around us and the world are. Hedonic measures, which are, tend to be binary measures of emotional or affective states, so of feeling 
um, you know, sort of good or bad of those contrasts and um, flourishing measures. So those often are used to describe the, the kind of ultimate outcome of subjective well-being. Um, and that is the, our capacity to live our lives to uh, the fullest. This particular framework combines those objective and well and subjective measures of well-being. Um, and this is found in, in the book by um, Plough in 2020, but that combines these ways of looking at well-being as measured on objective scales or subjective scales, and combines that with different levels of social interaction, um, if we can call it that. So at the level of the individual, those subjective measures may be about our ability to make choices about our own lives and the course of our lives, whether or not we have access to healthcare and leisure activities, what social connections we have. And then on the objective side, we might see those measures such as household incomes, clinical and epidemiological incomes, and other measures of social connections. And we see that as well in at the community or regional level where we can see how well-being can be um, impacted by things like our satisfaction with the features, the built environment in our community, um, but also things like the perceived safety of our neighborhood. And then all the way up to the level of governance and policies or, or what in this um, framework is called civic well-being is the role of government and policy in guiding, um, shaping and influencing uh, our well-being. Also included in this um, in this particular framework, and it's worth mentioning because it does tend to have a central role in most of the well-being policies we've seen emerge, and that is the inclusion of um, the environment um, ecosystems, um, both social and and in nature, um, and climate change to these um, these policies. So. It may be in part because of the time at which they have emerged, but certainly um, climate change and environmental sustainability have played a central role um, in these policies. So that um, sort of gives a sense of the context and the introduction in talking about um, well-being initiatives and well-being policies. And I will pause just for a couple of minutes now. And if you have a question, please feel free to type it into the Q&A box and I'll remind people that we'll be using Q&A for questions and that you're able hopefully as well to vote on those questions uh, if there's one or two that you would particularly like to see um, asked. So I'll pause and ask Milen if we have any questions um, at this time. Uh, well, at this time, there was only a question regarding the slides, if they were gonna be shared after the presentation. Yes, the PowerPoint presentation and the recording will be available on our website and we will share the link with you. Okay, so if there are no other questions, then as Milen said, we will be fairly quickly, I think these are up on our site uh, and available to look at the slides and um, review the video if you so choose. So what I'm going to be talking about for the next little while is an analysis that was done by my colleague, um, Hélène Poliquin, who looked at the well-being initiatives of four um, central governments in an attempt to, um, to look at what they had in common, what sort of common frameworks they used, and what the role of public health was, if there was one, um, in designing and implementing these um, initiatives. And I do just want to point out that it then is no longer with the NCCHPP. She, she left us at the end of the summer, but we did work on the project together. We were both involved in the wellbeing project. So I do have, um, you know, I was able to share this with Elena as she was working on it. And while I'm sure I won't be able to um, regale you with my knowledge of the details of the four different policy, the way that Elen would be able to, I will do my best, I think, to render um, the common features and the challenges that we see in these initiatives. So just a quick methodological note, this study 
was carried out in two phases. The first phase in the literature review, simply to see, um, to identify all of the different case uh, studies that would be possible to look at, or the cases of well-being initiatives that would be possible to look at. And once the four um, countries were settled on, uh, then a second search of the literature was done to, to sort of dig uh, down into that. And for the purposes of this study, um, whole of government well-being approaches was defined as having as policies or initiatives that expressly um, talk about the intention of a government to establish well-being objectives and to include the whole or significant parts of the government apparatus to um, contribute to the outcomes or to the policies and their outcomes. That the initiatives be associated with concrete policy instruments. So whether that's the budgetary process or legislation, but something that goes beyond um, you know, statements of principle or election promises, for example, concrete policy instrument and that they include ways of measuring and publicly reporting on progress using indicators that go beyond um, the standard economic indicators such as GDP. So in other words, that there be some form of public accountability for um, well-being. The four initiatives that were studied, as you can see here, were Scotland, Finland, Wales, and New Zealand. And what um, was looked at were the overall well-being frameworks that they used or mobilized or in some cases designed, what the main objection, uh, objectives were of the policy, how the implementation evaluation accountability mechanisms operated, what the roles of different actors were in these various policies, what kinds of difficulties were encountered along the way and what possible pathways are suggested for overcoming some of these um, difficulties that were encountered. So the policies, the specific policies were just, that were studied are the National Performance Framework um, from Scotland, the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act of Wales, the Agenda 2030 in Finland and New Zealand's um, well-being budget. I might just mention here, some of you may know this, but in keeping with what I mentioned earlier about the centrality of um, environmental sustainability and climate change to many of these initiatives, the Well-being of Future Generations Act in Wales was originally designed as a um, sustainable development. Um, policy that that sort of changed throughout the years as it was being designed to uh, become the well-being of future generations um, act. So there is there are links uh, that are many and quite deep between those two approaches. So some of the common features of these well-being initiatives um, include that there is a, a kind of whole of government roadmap or, or some kind of layout for how this is to be a whole of, of government approach and that cooperation is both horizontal and um, vertical. So between departments and sectors, as well as um, up and down the, the various government and civil society organizations, that there is some kind of integrative governance, that it be multi-sectoral or multi-level um, administration. In terms of the development of the initiatives, um, they share having leadership of senior public servants and senior and elected officials as well in most cases. They were developed over the course of uh, a number of years as, as some of these broad policies often are. Um, and that all four of them draw inspiration from international work on well-being initiatives and previous engagements. So the standard development goals, um, engagements with the OECD, uh, Paris Agreement on Climate Change, uh, et cetera. And um, as governance tool, that there be a kind of common language and shared vision and responsibility for um, these initiatives, 
um, and that they represent a kind of a forward looking governing tool or, or a tool for um, governing for the future. In terms of their main objectives of the study and what they share, um, the common features of, of the initiatives that we looked at, um, they share um, a central role, an importance of the performance of the government apparatus, so the need to um, include uh, various levels of government and departments and to work um, well together, that there be transparency and accountability for um, these policies from the various levels and departments, um, that they take prosperity into account, that there is collaboration and shared responsibility. Um, and again, as I, as I said before, they tend to be forward-looking policies um, explicitly in most cases, implicitly if not, but looking towards the future and particularly the well-being of future generations, that there be some kind of protection of the environment or that there was in all four cases, um, that in all four cases, there is um, a perceived need to affirm and promote um, cultural and national identities and languages. There are possible lessons there, particularly from places like Wales and New Zealand for Canada in terms of um, language duality, as well as um, the important role to be played by indigenous populations. Um, that all four of them promote justice and equity for the entire population. Um, so attempt to build on um, inclusivity and that there is a form of international solidarity and cooperation. Again, this is particular to well-being policies, but um, the formation of several organization and commitment to international um, goals is a feature of these types of, of policies. Some more of the common features of the approaches include that they all rely on some kind of a well being um, frameworks that include domains and or um, dimensions of well being. The example that's on the screen there is the 12 domains of current well being from the um, well being budget of New Zealand, but each of them has, at the very least, but they have, uh, in fact, these and much more well-being divided into different domains and then different dimensions um, on which to understand and measure well-being. They um, set goals and objectives for meeting those goals and they have included a kind of dashboard or a table um, of indicators um, that um, give a portrait of, of well-being. They um, all of the frameworks are viewed or all of the policies are viewed as being multidimensional. So they include well-being in terms of psychological, social, economic, environmental, and cultural um, facets, both subjective and objective. So tend to combine measures um, of well-being. They are forward-looking, um, as I've said, so include future generations and are explicitly linked to measures um, and a commitment to um, sustainable development. Some of the um, questions surrounding the mechanisms for implementation, evaluation, and accountability of these frameworks. Um, again, there are features here that are shared between them and they um, have um, all included some kind of means to achieve the objectives, but they've been slightly different. So in some cases, New Zealand notably, um, they well-being indicators are worked into the national budgeting process. There are legislative measures. So the, the drafting and the adopting of laws to guide um, action on well-being, uh, various reports integrated into policy cycles of, of well-being policy. So the need to have um, ongoing uh, data on the success of these policies and a variety of accompanying policies, guides, and tools um, meant to aid with the implementation uh, of these initiatives. The people who have been involved in 
um, implementing well-being policies include um, teams that are devoted to building uh, capacity to experts and both professional and citizen experts contributing knowledge um, to the well-being policies, the setting up of independent commissions in some cases, so having an office specifically dedicated to um, the implementation of the well-being approach. This is the case, for example, in um, Wales. Um, and that they have included to varying degrees campaigns of public awareness uh, and communication in an attempt that there is a shared um, vision in many cases of well being initiatives as necessitating a kind of culture change. So the accompanying communications and public awareness campaigns um, have been seen as um, central. Some of the challenges that have been seen in implementing these approaches uh, occur generally at two levels. And one is in, in terms of their, their governance um, and the sometimes existence of competing policies and strategy, strategies that might um, compete for the same resources or that may appear even to be contradictory. And, and that may be the case in, in places and in jurisdictions like Canada that have multiple jurisdictional responsibilities for um, different policies that can sometimes make it difficult um, to all push sort of in the same direction on one policy or, or one initiative. So we may see these um, as kind of um, being in contradiction or in competition with each other. We also may have the appearance of kind of conflict of interest of interest and the, the short-term thinking that tends to characterize um, many of our policies into policy cycles or government cycles, uh, even more specifically. Um, there has been um, an imbalance in some cases in, in the sharing of power and responsibilities. So anytime a policy requires the direct implication and involvement of many different um, government departments and um, levels and ministries, et cetera, it can be difficult to find that balance of sort of who's carrying what part of that um, puzzle piece. And then anything that modifies the budgeting process can tend to um, create extra complications. One of the um, other areas, the main areas where there have been challenges in implementing these initiatives is in um, the area of knowledge and capacity or capacity building. Um, and sometimes those are based on a misunderstanding or oversimplification of goals and objective, owing in part to the fact that they tend to be so multi-dimensional um, and involve so many different people and measures of well-being. Um, difficulty sometimes in uh, obtaining data because one of the features of well-being initiatives is not you know, exclusive to well-being initiatives, but is there oftentimes reliance on existing data and indicators um, and choosing those. So sometimes those can be tricky or outright um, impossible to obtain the permission to use or permission to use. Um, and then, and this again is not specific to these initiatives, but the, a lack of balance sometimes between the time spent designing the policies, collecting the data and concrete actions meant um, to improve well-being. Um, of the population can represent another challenge. So what that means is that the, the biggest impediments to, um, to implementing these policies in the cases that we looked at, um, and that, that can probably be projected to in other cases as well, is that sometimes the implementation can be partial, uh, can at, at least in terms of appearance, appear to be somewhat superficial and take enormous amounts of times to implement. There's also, and this may be related to um, government um, terms, um, generally the sort of four year cycle thinking, um, and that is the um, difficulty in acting preventively and particularly planning for the long term, um, planning for the long term that is required by acting um, preventively. 
So what we've seen in some of these cases in terms of the roles for uh, public health and public health actors is to look at where uh, or what public health uh, has been able to contribute. And that is in many cases, and, and this again kind of harkens back to your assertions during the registration process that um, there is a role for public health and there's certainly many facets of well-being initiatives and well-being um, you know, indicator sets and dashboards that is familiar to those working in public health so that it is a fairly quick assimilation of new uh, approaches and data and that can be used to and has been used to help guide the decisions in choosing things like indicators uh, to use in the dashboard. It also, public health also um, in many cases has the capacity to um, evaluate the policy impacts of these initiatives. In what ways public health um, has done this includes the contributing of knowledge and expertise, expertise and advising um, decision makers in areas familiar to public health, such as health promotion, the determinants of health, uh, health inequities, um, et cetera. And so there have been a variety of publications used in developing the four um, initiatives that we're talking about, some that, that were um, published regardless of the well-being initiatives, some um, specifically tailored to the development of those policies. Um, the use of epidemiological data on well-being indicators to track trend, various implementation tools and strategic action plans, um, training activities, acting as um, role models, um, our role as advocates oftentimes, and so in some cases the publication or um, presentations um, of opinion pieces around well-being and the importance of um, well-being and preventive action. Um, one of the examples of this is in terms of the Wales initiative um, that public health was involved in producing reports and in looking at the outcomes uh, linked to 46 of their um, well-being indicators um, and how they were related to public health. So in terms of guiding the actions for the policy um, and regularly updating and associating um, these particular measures with other policy um, tools and documents. So if we look at this from um, a, a kind of summary of the, the, the avenues for success or the kind of promising um, ways forward for uh, reaching well-being goals through well-being policies, there does seem to be a need for or a perceived need for strong central government leadership. Um, so in all four cases, there is a drive within departments and ministries of the national government in, in these cases um, to lead um, well-being initiatives. There has been, in most cases, a guardian of some sort, a commissioner appointed um, for the well-being initiative. And this is something that um, a month or so ago, the Commissioner for Well-Being for Future Generations Act from Wales, Sophie Howe, visited Canada and gave a couple of presentations, which some of you may have seen. But one of the things that stuck with me that she pointed out or felt very strongly about was that well-being initiatives be uh, anchored by legislation and be, um, in the case of Wales, have one person who is dedicated to holding this legislation and to um, sort of holding the government to its promises um, in regards to this, this type of legislation, and particularly simply because it involves so many and so vast um, a field of actors that it does require an office, uh, a person and or an office to oversee uh, that type of coordination. To ensure the contribution that everyone contributes to integrate 
uh, the objectives into the political process uh, and to encourage the active participation of non-governmental um, groups, including community groups and other um, local initiatives, for example. On the bottom right of this graphic, you can see the areas where there has been the strongest public health contributions and that um, is um, purported to be in the areas of providing the support necessary for culture change. So again, with the vast knowledge of public health um, in areas such as the social determinants of health, um, makes us available in a certain sense for um, training and the tools that we have for understanding um, things like the social determinants and how they can be impacted by um, policy. And then in terms of determining best practices and lessons learned from um, particularly policy initiatives is a further contribution uh, of public health. So I will just have a couple more slides to, to share and by way of concluding or summarizing these whole of government well-being policies, um, although they are certainly recent, over the last um, you know, four or five years and are still emerging and continue to emerge in several countries and are still developing, the policy is still developing, the central government policy is still developing here in Canada. They appear to be promising and they do spark interest um, from public health and public health appears to have much to contribute to these well-being initiatives in terms of um, our familiarity with the reliance on and the importance of an evidence base for um, policy initiatives, well-being um, policies can be levers for acting on the social determinants of health and for um, reducing health uh, inequalities and health inequities. Um, they may be a way of integrating a health and all policies approach. That is something that uh, many people have pointed out and see as a um, promising sign for this type of initiatives. And um, they appear to be successful, at least in the limited number of cases that we have and, and over the fairly short period of time in breaking down uh, administrative and sectoral um, silos. So rather than have sort of one um, central conclusion, I will leave as food for thought um, and perhaps ask you um, your thoughts uh, on this topic, and that is what are the risks and opportunities of well-being policies for public health? So if, again, we go back to the very beginning when I said that the overwhelming majority of the people with us today see um, an important role for public health and well-being policy initiatives, um, perhaps we can think about what those opportunities are and if there are risks associated with them um, as well. So just before ending, again, these will be available and there, th these documents are already available on our site, but um, there are resources on our site on well-being, well-being policies and well-being um, budgeting. Through a couple list of references and stop um, for questions if there's anything you would like to ask we do ask that you type the questions um, simply because um, of the number of people present um, we won't be able to turn on the microphones but please feel free to ask questions share thoughts uh, in the q a um, and i will ask milen at this time to let us know if there are questions Thank you so much, Val. We do have a question from Gloria uh, saying, related to your acknowledgement of gov government terms not being conducive to preventive long-term thinking. I'm curious if the four initiatives included in the study indicated ways around this hurdle, perhaps this is coming later in the presentation, uh, how do we inspire long-term thinking and action when decision-making power is only held for short periods? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for the question. It, it's super interesting and one that I find preoccupying as well. Um, I don't have a definitive answer for the four policies. Um, 
there, I don't want to, I ask, this is something that I should look into, but I'm not sure that there has been a government change in one of those four countries since the adoption of these policies. I, I'm, I'm positive about Scotland and New Zealand. I'm not 100% sure about Wales and Finland. Um, but one of the things that people have mentioned, and, and this um, will be really important in moving these policies forward, is how crucial it is that this type of policy not be tied to a specific political party. Of necessity, they will be tied to a, to a specific government. But I have heard the kind of, I don't know if I would call it the warning or um, a little bit of concern with um, New Zealand's well-being budget, not because of any um, sort of concerns about the policy itself, but because of how uh, tightly it seemed to be tied to the Labour government in um, New Zealand as a political party. And so one of the important ways of avoiding um, having this these policies be a kind of flash in the pan, um, to use that metaphor, is that they, they be designed and built in such a way and adopted as legislation, which allows for them to be carried forward, um, that are not tied to the reputation of the political party that adopts them. I don't know if that's a complete answer. That's certainly something that I have heard expressed. Um, and I think it's something that we will, we will want to watch for in Canada as well, as this policy has been um, designed under one particular government. There's no indication that you know, it, it, it would end if we changed government, but it might be the kind of policy that we will want to pay attention to making sure that it has um, those sorts of fail saves. And they, they do exist and making, making them legislation like in them law is, is one of the ways that that can be assured, but it's tricky and it's always a concern for long-term. Thank you, Val. Next question is from Amanda. Looking at the slide listing concrete contributions for public health actors in Canada, which public health actors are best suited to carry out these actions? A very super simple question. <laughs> um, I think the answer is probably probably most of us, but I think it depends on when and where in the process. So we know, for example, that folks at the Public Health Agency of Canada, some of them may be on the line with us today, um, contributed from the very early stages um, to the, the designs of the policy in terms of, of what types of indicators uh, are available, um, how the social determinants of health, for example, have been used historically um, in Canada. So there's, a, there's involvement at that very early stage. Um, and then there's a role as well, and there are, there are many in between. There are leadership roles for um, you know, the culture change that's seen as necessary, quite likely. There are also a whole host of um, implementation roles. So when these, um, when these policies or initiatives are adopted, then in many cases, they come accompanied with strategic action plans and specific action guidelines that um, have been and could be carried out um, by public health. Um, and I think the, you know, at various times during the process, the expertise that pub public health has developed on the link between what we call the social determinants of health um, and health outcomes is, is crucial knowledge, right? In all kinds of policy areas and life circumstance areas that have an impact on health that, um, that are readily recognized in public health, but perhaps not that well known outside of public health. Um, and so there's a role there too. So a, a variety of roles, I think, depending on where we sit in public health and where the policy is in its, in its development implementation analysis. Thank you. There was a question in a chat box from Michael. Um, in your discussion of government governance challenges, you mentioned it can be confusing. Who is responsible for what? 
However, Canadian central agencies such as cabinet offices, ministries of finance, treasury boards, all see themselves as fulfilling the functions we're suggesting be given to others. In Quebec, the Ministry of Finance simply doesn't follow Section 54 of the Public Health Act. I would be interested in your views about how to deal with these powerful agencies who don't want to give up what they see as their roles. Wow. Um, I'm not sure that I have an answer. Um, I have an answer for this, but it is a concern. And I mentioned it before in, in terms of data and access to data. And that, and that um, it's not my area, so I, I can't speak in too much detail to it. But that's certainly something that presents a challenge uh, in Canada. And I know in the past, particularly data um, from Quebec. And it also, one of the, the layers of complexity in this type of policies um, are the, the ownership of the policy, right? That it tends um, to touch in areas that different ministries and departments might feel is their um, area. And so there can be, and I'm not aware of specific examples in the, the four policies that we looked at, um, but it's certainly not difficult to imagine that there are issues of ownership and power um, over who controls what. That's only a very small and partial answer to your question, um, but um, yes, definitely complex. Next question is from Eric. There are a number of well-being indices such as the Social Progress Index, the Genuine Progress Index, the OECD Better Life Index, etc. They all have their strengths and weaknesses. One weakness being the difficulty people to conceptually use the resulting number in relation to the many issues that produce personal and community well-being. Would you say that selecting key indicators in a number of themes would be easier for the public to understand? Um, yes, I think it would be. Um, it's incredibly complex. And, and again, beyond my capacity to figure out how to, to sort of narrow down the indicators, there are people that are in you know much better position to discuss this um, than I am. But there have tended to be, in terms of these policies, as I said earlier, kind of dashboard of indicators that is similar to the the Canadian quality of life strategy. Um, I don't have it written down in front of me, but the number of indicators I believe ranges in these four policies from 45 in Finland to 81 in Scotland, um, if I'm not mistaken. So that is what tends to be used. Like the example I showed either in domains or dimensions, you know, there, are, there can be four. Um, Usually we have a, you know, dimensions, domains, and then further broken down into indicators then that are, that are operationalized and that are used um, you know, as stand-ins. Um, but I think that, um, you know, that you're right, you put your, your finger on something that makes it more complex perhaps, but is also necessary in making sure that you get the right um, indicators uh, for the right, um, in, in the right dimensions. Thank you. And um, Eric is also asking if uh, he's saying, I understand that the federal government is looking at a broader range of quality of life indicators. So he's asking if maybe you have uh, briefed the Pan-Canadian Public Health Networks about your findings, or if you have uh, presented to various ministries at the federal level. We, we are involved in discussions with a number of different people. I don't know that, um, I don't know that there's been specific briefings on this work, but we are involved in a number of discussions with different groups working on uh, well-being policies as well as um, people and, and organizations within the federal government as well. Yeah. Perfect. Uh, Andrea is mentioning the roles of public health could extend beyond the red box you highlighted, like HIAP, 
health in all policy, well-being approaches provide an opportunity for public health to advocate for budgets that don't continually allow either ever-growing medical spending to crowd out spending on social determinants of health. How do you think public health can take on a role in influencing these kinds of central government instruments, even if this means advocating for spending outside of the traditional health envelope? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, we had one of the one of the pieces that we published was a, a guest um, invited commentary by Dr. Lindsay McLaren, who and it's available on our site if you're interested in looking at it. She addresses this this question, um, and that is the notion of, of in part it's the notion of ownership of this type of policy. You know, is it does it sit squarely in the public health um, domain? But also, are we in the, the strange and you know, maybe dubious position of advocating that governments take money away from public health to give to something that will affect public health um, in a sense in the long term? Um, so there is, I, I'm not sure that I have, uh, Andrea, a specific answer for how public health can be um, involved in advocating for spending particularly um, you know, we're in a we're in a particular moment in terms of healthcare spending right now in Canada. So um, it'll be something we'll be keeping our eye on. But you're absolutely right that the role for public health does go beyond that that little box on on the right side. That was just a kind of um, one uh, area that was singled out for focus in in the four or it was two areas actually singled out for focus in the um, in the initiatives. And now a question from Amanda. So much of health plays out at the community level, but these broad government indices work best with large data sets that don't work at the community level, especially for smaller cities or small towns. Do you have insights about how we can better link this level of national policy to the local? Mm -hmm. um, it, yeah, that's a super... Um, important part of these policies because most of the time the, the you know the broader policy acts as a kind of guideline and in this case acts as you know a, a way of accounting for um, how a population is faring but at the local level these sort of broad policies need to be kind of broken down and adapted so that they fit with local conditions so we do have um, local examples um, in the Canadian context, I'm certainly aware of um, Engage Nova Scotia. If you check um, on the web, you can find um, their site. I don't know if me then if, if, if a quick search might lead to the site for Engage Nova Scotia. Um, and there are a number of local, particularly municipal governments involved in local initiatives. So it's a question of adapting. And like many policies that are kind of overarching, um, you know, whether they're national or supranational policies, them being in place often allows for them to be adapted into local conditions. And sometimes that might be as um, simple as they are available for funding local initiatives or um, you know different programs might become available in smaller cities or small towns rural areas etc so um, it's a question of adapting them um, and in some cases there have been other types of of well-being initiatives at the local um, and regional level thank you so much Val. Uh, there are a lot of discussions in the chat box uh, Mr. Trevor Hancock is uh, sharing uh, various uh, resources on uh, well-being and uh, also uh, Richard and uh, Lisa and oh great okay they, so they mentioned uh, the donuts uh, economic mm -hmm. to donut uh, economic. yeah well-being budget okay fantastic uh, yep. uh, and all of those will be available so if you um, as we as we end the webinar and turn off the recording, if you didn't get a chance to follow the links that were provided um, that you shared with each other during the the webinar, they will still be there, right, Milen? People will mm -hmm. still be able to go into the chat 
um, and get them. And there's a number, I just pulled it up and see, you know, the, the Geneva Charter mentioned and yeah, Donut Economics. Um, thank you everyone for contributing that. And I, are there any more questions to be then or are we, are we at the end of, oh, we are at the end. Uh, no, no other question. Okay, thank you. perfect. So the, the clock just turned to three o'clock in um, Eastern Daylight Savings Time. So um, we'll just end there again. Thank you, Milena and Alexandra. Thank you everyone for joining us today. And again, a reminder, you'll receive a link for the evaluation that um, is really helpful for us if you fill those out in um, you know, adapting the content uh, scope of our webinars. webinars. And um, thank you. We'll look forward to seeing you all again soon. Bye-bye.